Mohammed Atta and two more 9-11 hijackers had spent considerable time in the German city of Hamburg before they moved to the United States. Several others from the so-called Hamburg cell of Al-Qaeda were complicit in the planning but were unable to go to America. Would have been nice if those men were caught early. My own cousin John was a New York firefighter. He was working search and rescue on the afternoon of September 11th, 2001, when a third building fell. He lost his helmet and years later it was returned to him. It was very difficult on that day to reach him on the phone or reach his colleagues to check if he was alive and well. He could have died that day and then followed the so-called war on terror, which caused a staggering number of deaths and harmed the United States' reputation. And from the first moment, Russian propaganda tried to further damage America's reputation and tried to get Europe and the Muslim world to abandon America. And this whole mess could have been prevented years earlier in a German city, Hamburg. At the time of the Al-Qaeda Hamburg cell, a man was responsible for security in the city named Olaf Scholz from the left Social Democratic Party. He is currently our chancellor. He used to be very pro-Russia. In his early days, he visited Soviet East Germany multiple times, was treated like a very important person, and he was very anti-America. On the day of 9-11, alarm bells were ringing, of course, in Hamburg. The suspect, Mohammed Atta, had actually lived at Marienstraße 54. Over the course of the night, eight apartments were raided. The responsible bureaucrats said this was all an unfortunate coincidence. It could have been another city. You know, we had no real idea. This was all just uh, very unfortunate. And yes, these terrorists did visit the radical Al-Quds mosque uh, in the city, but, you know, nobody saw this coming. In late 1999, Atta and three members of the cell visited Afghanistan to join jihad and get training. But um, we were told these men had not really been on anybody's radar that much. So, 9-11 happened, the war on terror... Russia tries extra hard to ruin America's reputation. And the German chancellor at the time, Gerhard Schröder, who was very close to Russian President Putin, wanted to move Germany away from the US and closer to Russia. Schröder is from the same party as Olaf Scholz, who was responsible for security in Hamburg. These Al-Qaeda people met with Osama bin Laden himself and swore their loyalty to him. Mohammed Atta was chosen by bin Laden as the leader of the group that would attack America. Atta would contact bin Laden several more times before the attacks. The men then returned to Germany to enroll in flight training school and later moved on to flight training schools in the United States at the recommendation of one of their instructors or handlers based in Germany. Many Al-Qaeda members lived in the Hamburg apartment at various times. In all, 29 men listed the apartment as their home address while Mohammed Atta's name was on the lease. Reportedly, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed visited the apartment repeatedly. So, one might think that one bug, one listening device could have blown the entire group. Just one listening device in the apartment. You know, a listening device nowadays doesn't doesn't cost much. Uh, operating is, it is not complicated at all. It says German intelligence, uh, German intelligence monitored the apartment, but did not find any evidence against the residents. You know, nothing that could get them further into the apartment, they say. Um, you know, there is there is a way around German law for surveillance purposes. And it works like this. You tell the Brits or the Americans, you know, there are some guys there and we don't have enough yet to plant listening devices um, to get the warrant. If only somebody could magically listen to what's happening inside that stupid apartment. And then if evidence just happens to land in our special, you know, German intelligence inbox, that would be great. And we would not really ask many questions where this stuff came from. You know, this this is kind of the, you know, 
this is kind of a, a great trick you can pull. In Hamburg, Atta was intensely drawn to the Al-Quds Mosque, which adhered to a harsh, uncompromisingly fundamentalist and resoundingly militant version of Sunni Islam. Uh, and uh, normally you would expect German intelligence, or in that matter, Hamburg intelligence, uh, you would expect them to uh, recruit sources you know, uh, in that mosque or to send assets, informants, um, or full-on agents into that mosque. You know, to to get the lay of the land. You know, who is who, who's saying what, and then you can just move a, move ahead and you know uh, try to get warrants for surveillance. And it, it's not like um, it's not like German uh, domestic intelligence people are the most well-behaved guys you can imagine. I mean, there have been many, many, many scandals and lack of transparency. So why didn't they achieve more? That's an interesting question. Atta also started and led a prayer group, which Ahmed Maklat and Munir El Montasadek joined. Ramzi bin Alshib was also there. Many Al-Qaeda members lived in Atta's apartment at various times, as I said, including hijacker Marvan al Shei, Zakaria Esaba, and others. On March 22, 2000, Atta was still in Germany when he sent an email to the Academy of Lakeland in Florida. He inquired about flight training. And uh, yeah, so basically he said, uh, we're a small group of uh, Muslims <laughs> from Arab countries. Uh, we've been living in Germany for a while and we would like to go to America to learn at flight schools. Atta sent roughly 60 emails like this to flights, flight training schools in the United States. Uh, on May 17th, Atta applied for a United States visa. The next day, he received a five-year tourist business visa from the United States Embassy in Berlin. Blimey, that was fast. Atta had lived in Germany for approximately five years and also had a strong record as a student. He was therefore treated favorably and not scrutinized. Okay, wait a second, wait a second. He would... Uh, he was visiting the, the the radical mosque in uh, Hamburg. You know, he was he was known to be a you know he was kind of known to be a radical at some point. And you know, um, there were uh, certainly uh, there were certainly investigations going on. You know, against these circles, but still, nobody bothered really. Apparently, uh, on the German side, uh, on the the German side, nobody bothered really to warn the Americans and say, you know, we're not sure about these guys. So maybe, maybe you shouldn't let them into, into America. You know, it, it wouldn't be a good idea. You can find other, you know, migrants who can become pilots, you know, but, but not these guys. You know, it's a bad idea. What really happened there? So, um, yeah, he was treated favorably and not scrutinized because, well, he, you know, he, he was a student. He lived in Germany for five years and that's enough. Uh, 2002, ABC's World News Tonight broadcast an interview with Joan L. Bryant, former loan officer at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in South Florida, uh, who told about her encounter with Mohammed Atta. So, um, uh, according to Bryant, Atta was just Atta was just nuts. You know, he was talking all kinds of you know, insane stuff. Um, so he wanted to uh, finance, you know, a plane and weird plane and modify it. And and uh, he wants to go to flight school and he asked about the Pentagon and the White House. He wanted to visit the World Trade Center and asked about security at the World Trade Center. He mentioned Al-Qaeda and said the organization could use memberships from Americans. He mentioned Osama bin Laden, you know, and praised Osama bin Laden. Uh Brian contacted the authorities after recognizing Atta in news reports, you know, when the, the attacks happened. So imagine this. This dude, this dude, you know, visits the radical mosque in, in Hamburg and he's he's got all these contacts and he's hanging around with these people. He applies for a visa, gets it basically the next day, goes to America, and then he wants a loan. You know, and he, he could have just said, well, you know, I want, want to buy this plane. You know, I want to become a pilot. So I want to finance a small plane, you know, just to become a better pilot. But no, he just starts talking about the World Trade Center and Al-Qaeda and the Pentagon and what's the security like at the World Trade Center. I mean, this is nuts. 
totally nuts. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you really think this guy was able to shield his intentions for so long, especially in Germany. Um, in August, Atta's driver li driver's license was revoked in absentia after he failed to show up in traffic court. Uh, and uh, the same, same day, the Israeli Mossad gave his name to the CIA as one of 19 U.S. residents suspected of planning an imminent attack against the United States. Only four of the names are publicly known. Uh, in 2005, Army Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer and Congressman Kurt Weldon alleged that the Defense Department data mining project Able Danger produced a chart that identified Atta along with Nawaf al-Hazmi, Khalid al-Mindar and Marvin al shay as members of a Brooklyn-based Al-Qaeda cell in early 2000. The French knew about Zakaria's Musawi and warned about him. Uh, Catherine Kaiser from the American FBI learned from FBI Special Agent Harry Smith, an Algerian with a French passport and expired visa named Zacharias Musawi, wanted to learn to fly a Boeing 747 without takeoffs and landings. They couldn't get a FISA court order to search his laptop. For three weeks, Kaiser tried desperately to get the investigation rolling. Previously, FBI agent Ken Williams sent a report to the FBI Special Divisions uh, about radicalism and Bin Laden, and it's he said there was an entire Al Qaeda network of flights, you know, at flight schools. The special department took that lead, stuffed it into a pile of three thousand other clues, and assigned two people to the pile. And the responsible counterterrorism director Dale Watson was deputy chief of the CIA's counterterrorism center. He later went to Booz Allen Hamilton. Robert Baer, an ex CIA. Uh, agent explained the core problem before 9-11. Uh, High-ranking moles, traitors, had compromised American intelligence domestically and internationally. People like Robert Hansen and Aldrich Ames, they had sold information to Russia and they destroyed American intelligence to a large degree. Robert Baer and others suspect that there were and are even more moles active. Now, from the mole cases we already know, we understand very well how that works, you know, how people get recruited, uh, for example, by the Russians uh, and uh, how they are then developed and they get access to more and more documents and they get paid uh, more and more for their, uh, for their treason. And such traitors were theoretically able to shield Mohammed Atta and his people you know, sabotage the FBI investigations. And uh, Germany has always had a fundamental problem with moles working for Russia as well. So right now, uh, right now, there's a court case going on, a court case active, probably the worst mole since the Cold War. You know, it's just uh, a leading official from the German Foreign Intelligence uh, Service. And uh he he's being accused of selling all kinds of intel to the Russians, and this also touches upon sensitive, um, you know, methods and operations of the Americans. So this is also a problem for uh, for America. So um, it's not just foreign intel that was compromised again and again in Germany. It was also the domestic intelligence um, services that were compromised over and over and over again. So it's not that difficult you know if these moles are in place to sabotage investigations um in germany and uh, it's also not difficult to um you know sabotage investigations in the uh, in the united states and uh so this is something that um we can now piece together um bit by bit point by point and uh so uh, we're trying to get closer to reality, what actually happened uh, and and uh, what it all means. As I said, as I said, 9-11 uh, was followed by the war on terror and this shredded America's reputation worldwide. And um, Russia tried to benefit from that. They, the Russians, they, they tried to um, make the whole world hate America as much as possible. And Russia was also advertising for itself, for its own role as a global leader, as uh, the supposedly better alternative to the United States of America.
And so, uh, right after the attacks um, of 9-11, you saw quite a bit of, you know, conspiracy activism. And that activism is very, very different from, you know, professional grade intelligence analysis. You know, the professionals, they try to check out different scenarios, try to view different angles. They're constantly questioning their own work. You know, do we have a bias? Do we... Um, are we not seeing something here? There's the stuff that you know, then there's the stuff where you kind of have an idea what it is, but you don't know it yet. So it's the they call it the known unknowns. And then you have stuff that you're completely unaware of. You know, it's just kind of the you know uh, the dark field of things that you need to uncover. And um, so when uh, when the conspiracy buffs try to uh, try to you know report on on the matter on the case uh some of the stuff that was reported was you know some of the stuff that was reported on or quoted on so, some of it was real like some of the fbi uh investigations and how they were hindered in their investigations um but it was tied into this you know old school conspiracy buff type uh narrative you know so it's 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 a very primitive narrative it's it's also um oftentimes a very anti-jewish narrative you know as if uh you know the, the tiniest jewish families had um uh, taken over the mighty british empire you know with no real effort and they also took over america so everything bad that happened you know was this goes supposedly back to that um that conspiracy, um, but in in the real world, you have intelligence networks, you have moles, you have all these different um, elements and moving parts, and so it's not surprising that the Russians they they wanted to influence uh, the conspiracy movement from the first moment, you know, and just um, interpret nine eleven as. Um, as a complete failure of America. So America is unfixable according to the Russians and it, you know, and uh, everybody needs to be angry about everything and, and uh, everybody should accept Russian leadership in this, um, in this world. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, the war on terror aggravated the Muslims and this also became a big problem for Israel, of course, it also became a big problem for anybody who was somehow uh, attached to America. And even experts warned that uh, the war on terror would create more problems, more terror, because the way it was conducted uh, was oftentimes very counterproductive. Uh, and so, um, yeah, you have to look into molds, you have to look uh, into professional sabotage. And uh, it's, not just, it's not just intelligence networks that you know, you know, the more modern type networks. There's also... Uh, quite a bit of suspicious activity going on by old intelligence networks, um, especially networks in the United States on U.S. soil. That networks that go back to the British colonial empire, you know, very old networks, and um, I specialize in, in that. Uh, and uh, you can find stuff about those networks on this channel. Uh, so please subscribe to this channel, you know, like this video and share it on social media. And you can also find my ebook about old intelligence networks in enlightenment and communism. So this seems to be sort of the secret sauce, the secret recipe, why communist states were so successful in their intelligence operations, because there's some significant connection um, of, uh, you know, Russia and China uh, to these old, uh, very old intelligence networks uh so yeah so um this this is kind of the the situation we're dealing with um especially in europe so everything and anything gets used to um try to get us here in western europe try to get us closer to russia and and you know uh get us under russian control so if ukraine falls then poland could fall next then germany could fall next and the russians will get all of that industry the russians will get all that expertise the, the specialized workers and the the engineers uh, in general the population which russia urgently needs so then the russians together with the chinese they will become a terrifying enemy for america for the united states